I have a seven-year-old son who is my most favorite little human in the whole world. And like most parents, I love to share stories about him. And so if you and I were talking, I would probably tell you um, how he recently has this new thing about knock-knock jokes. And he always comes home every day and tells me a new one that he thinks is hilarious, but makes absolutely no sense. Um, the other thing I might tell you about him is that on Fridays, he comes home and he's really excited because they had his favorite lunch at school. You know those rectangular pizzas? Yeah, I can tell who the public school kids in here are, right? Yeah, they're still serving those. And, uh, and he comes home and tells me on Fridays, he's so excited because they don't even burn the bottom like you do, Mom. <laughs> Great, thanks. So happy for you about that. Um, yeah, so those would be like very typical things that I would tell you about, about my seven-year-old. What you wouldn't hear me say is that last week he got his driver's license, or that next week we're gonna go look at colleges. And the reason you wouldn't hear me say that is because he's seven, right? Like that would not be age appropriate. And so as adults, we have this idea or this understanding of what is age appropriate for kids. And typically we get it right, but there's one area in which we have an inappropriate expectation of kids. And we're gonna talk about that today. So I have the amazing privilege of getting to work with people across the lifespan as a counselor. I see kids, teens, and adults. And I often have parents come into my office bringing their child and um, telling me you know, that their family has just been through something really difficult and that they're worried about their kid because they've been asking like, how are you feeling? How are you doing? and they're not really getting anything out of their kids, so they don't know what's going on in their inner world. And of course parents wanna know what's happening inside of their child. We wanna know how they're feeling so that we can best support them and love on them. And as adults, the way that we understand each other is through verbal communication, right? So when I'm talking with my friends and asking them, like, how are you feeling? How was your experience? And we can connect that way. But when we ask kids that, it doesn't always work that way because the problem is, is that kids' emotional development far outpaces their verbal development. And so they experience these deep, intense, abstract emotions long before they're able to concretely verbalize them. And we know this about babies, right? Because we don't ask our babies how they feel. We look at their faces, um, we kind of get their facial expressions, or we listen to their cries, and we learn to differentiate what things they need. And then eventually, as they get older, right, they start to develop some verbal skills. And so uh, when they're toddlers, they do start to use some words to say what they want and need. They can communicate, I want the yellow cup, only so that when you give them the yellow cup, they can throw it and scream and say they don't want the yellow cup anymore, right? Yes. Um, but what we miss in that transition from when babies don't have any language to young children who have some language to kids, older elementary age kids who can speak, um, is that even though they're developing verbal language, it's still not their primary form of communication. In fact, their primary form of communication is play. Play is the most natural way for kids to express themselves and for kids to process their inner world and what's going on in the world around them. And so when we ask a kid, tell me how you feel, tell me what's going on, in essence, we're asking them to come up to our level of communication rather than meeting them at their most basic level of communication through play. Gary Landreth, who is the father of play therapy, um, he says it this way. He says that play is the language of children and toys are their words. Play is the language of children and toys are their words. So this is my therapeutic playroom at my office. It's a very happy place. Um, there's lots of toys in there, um, and these toys are specifically chosen to help facilitate emotional expression in children. Um, and the most favorite area of play um, for kids when they come in here is my sand tray. Um, and so in this sand tray, and on the shelves next to it, you'll see there's all these different miniature items. And so kids, and actually teens and adults too sometimes, can pick different items to pull off the shelves and put them in the tray to create a scene um, that expresses what's going on internally for, for them. Or they might play out a story. 
So I had a client a couple years ago who um, her mom and dad had been through a really contentious divorce. Um, dad had been um, abusive verbally and physically, and uh, they had finally gotten away from that situation and had moved to a new area. And so mom brought her daughter in because mom wanted to know, like, I've tried to talk to her and see, like, how are you doing? And she just isn't really giving me anything. So I started meeting with her weekly, and after the first few weeks, when she started to feel more comfortable with me, she began to come in each week and go right over to my sand tray. And she would always pick the same figures and start to tell a story. And each week, she would get further and further along in that story. So she would take a big shark and three fish off of the shelves, and she would put them into the tray. And she would play out this big, scary shark chasing these three fish, and the mommy fish and the baby fish hiding in the sand, trying to build a fortress around them with rocks to keep themselves safe. Um, and she would play this out over and over, and then eventually one day, she introduced a dolphin into the story. And the dolphin came and uh, wrapped up the shark in chains and took the shark away and put him in jail. So the shark could never bother the mommy fish and the baby fish again. And then one day, and this was the last time that she played through this story, it ended with the mommy fish and the baby fish living in a brand new ocean in a happy and safe place and starting over. And so in this play, she processed her inner world. She processed her story. She shared the scary things that her dad had done, the things that her mom had done to keep her safe, how she had felt during that process, when the police came into her house and took her dad away, and then when she and her sister and her mom had moved to a new place to start over. She was able to process that story because she projected it onto toys. So she was telling the story through these toys, and it becomes less threatening because she's the one in charge and controlling the story, when it is shared, how it is shared, and it's projected onto these items. So it's empowering then, rather than threatening or terrifying for her to revisit this. But it's not just play alone. It's play that is witnessed by a safe and loving adult who can communicate back to the child, I see what you're showing me, and I'm not scared. I'm here with you in it, and I can hold this with you. And so as she's moving these items around and playing through the story, I'm saying back to her, wow, the fish were so scared. Oh, the mommy fish knows how to protect the baby fish. And now the fish can be happy, and the big shark won't ever hurt them again. This is the equivalent of an adult or a teenager sitting in my adult office and um, processing through their story, and me being able to sit with them in their, in their pain and allow them to feel understood and allow them to start healing. So I don't have the privilege of, uh, I haven't had the privilege of parenting a teenager yet, but I know my time is coming. Um, and a lot of my friends who have teenagers, they often have the same kind of complaints that parents do. Like, I try to talk to them, and I don't know what's going on, and I'll ask them, and they just kind of, mm, I don't know, right? You know, if they would put down their phone for five minutes so we could have a conversation, that would be great. But what's really interesting is that kids who played with their parents when they were a child are actually more likely to talk to their kids as teenagers. And the reason is it's because you know, as they grow, they start to play less as communication and verbalize more as communication. And I see this in my teen clients who I've been with since they were, since they were little kids. When they first came in, they would just play every session. And then as they started to get older, they would come in and they would play for a little bit, and then they would sit on my couch for a little bit and talk, and then they would play for a little bit, and then they would sit. And now they just come in and they sit and talk. Um, and it feels normal to them because they feel like they've been talking to me all along. So I know not all of us in here are parents, um, but I imagine that all of us have a child in our lives that's important. Maybe um, you work with kids as a profession, or maybe you're an aunt or an uncle. And so I have two challenges for us today. The first challenge is when you are with a child, instead of asking them how they're feeling or how they're doing, 
I would encourage you to see if you can observe them and then name that emotion yourself. The reason is, is because when people can name the emotion that we're feeling, we can feel regulated, we can feel connected. And so here's what I mean by regulated. Um, when we experience intense emotions, we can become hyper aroused, like when we feel angry or anxious, um, or we can feel hypo aroused, like when we feel sad or depressed, tired, worn out. And the ability to come back to normal is emotion regulation. The way that we do that is through coping skills um, or through connection. And so for kids, they often don't have a lot of coping skills yet, right? They're new here. They're still figuring it out. And so the way that they can return to regular, that regular state, is through connection. And when we name somebody's emotion, they feel understood and they feel connected. It happened to me just yesterday. I was talking to one of my friends about something that recently happened. And she said to me, oh, you must have been so frustrated. And I was like, yes, I was frustrated, yes. And it did, it helped me to come down into a state of emotion regulation. The other reason why we wanna name emotions for kids is because we want to increase their emotional literacy. So we name things for kids all the time, right? We teach them this is your nose, this is your mouth, these are your eyes. And so when a child is in an emotional state and is experiencing an emotion, when we name that, it gives them context for what it is. So if we can say to a child when they're you know, throwing a tantrum, which kids do, right? Oh, I can tell you're so angry. They start to learn, oh, that's what this is. When my body feels this way, when I act like this, when I feel this, when I think this, that's anger. It's less scary because it has a name now. And ideally, they can then start to use that name themselves. So that next time they feel that way, they can say, I'm angry. And when you can name it, it helps with that emotion regulation. So here's the second challenge. The first one, see if you can name an emotion for a child instead of asking them, how are you feeling or what's wrong? The second is if you have a child in your life, I would encourage you to play with them. Now I don't mean that you have to play with them all day, every day, all the time. Adults are busy, we have lots of things to do. But if you can play with a child, research shows, for just 15 minutes, a couple times a week, it actually, for that child, increases emotion regulation, decreases problem behaviors, and it can increase the attachment and the bond between the caregiver and the child. But here's the trick. This play needs to be child-led and child-directed. And so here's what I mean by that. First, what that means is try not to ask any questions. And actually, here's kind of a sub-challenge. Next time you're with a child, see if you can interact without asking any questions at all. It's actually really hard. We ask kids questions constantly. And when we do that, it's actually a way of us being in charge of the interaction. Let me give you an example. For that little girl who had come into my office, if she had picked out the shark and the fish, and she walked over to the sand tray, and instead of just waiting in the silence to see what she would do, I said, what's your favorite fish? She probably would have turned and answered me, and then ask me what mine was, and then who knows what would have happened, right? Who knows where the play would have gone? But instead, I was just comfortable to sit and wait and see what she would do. The second way that you can make sure that play is child-led is to really let them lead and direct the play. It would have been super fun in the middle of her story for me to be like, and then here comes the whirlpool, and now the fish are swimming over here, ah! Right? We would have laughed, we would have had a great time. And there's a time and a place for that kind of play. But it wouldn't have then been her processing her inner world, right? We have to let kids take the lead in order to do that. So those are the two challenges. See if you can not ask questions and see if you can let the child lead and direct the play. So I wanna end our time together today with some time travel. So think back to when you were a kid and I want you to imagine what it would have been like for you if you had had a caregiver in your life who really engaged with you and who let you lead in communicating with them. Someone that you really could share your inner world with in the way that was age appropriate for you. What might have been different about your childhood then? What might even be different about today for you? 
The truth is, we can do that for kids now. We can help them to feel understood, connected, accepted. We can enable them to begin to heal. And the way that we do that is not by asking them to come up to our level when we communicate, but by going down to their level and connecting with them through play. Thank you.